Hi, my name is Mike Lochran. In this video, we will discuss the primary pharmacokinetic parameter, volume of distribution. When a drug enters the body, from a pharmacokinetic perspective, two major things happen. It distributes and it gets eliminated, either through excretion or metabolism. And we describe these processes with the parameters volume of distribution and clearance. In this video, we will talk about volume of distribution. Now there are a number of videos on volume of distribution and some of them are quite good. So you may ask yourself, why would I make another one? I'm going to describe things a little differently than in these videos. And in the second part of this series, I'll use some examples that I hope will solidify the concept. But I would encourage you to watch some of these other videos, particularly there's a short video by handwritten tutorials on distribution that does a really good job of describing how molecules move for the, through the body. And then there's a whole series of pharmacology videos by Ario. I'm not even going to try to pronounce his last name, and I hope I'm pronouncing his first name correctly. But he has a whole series of pharmacology videos that are all excellent, and the volume of distribution video is no exception. There is one part of that video that I think needs some clarification and in the second part of this series I'll touch on that. So how do we figure out volume? So if we have something like a cube we can use simple geometry length times width times height to figure that out. If we have a cylinder we can still use geometry we just have to maybe Google search the the equation but we could figure that out in relatively short time. But what if we had a container that was like human shaped, that had all these curves and irregularities? We wouldn't be able to use geometry to figure out the volume of this container. Well, what we could do is we could fill it with water and then we could add a known amount of a drug into it and then analyze it for con its concentration. The experiment would look something like this. Say we put 500 milligrams into this container and then we analyzed it and we, we came up with a concentration of 12 milligrams per liter. We could use the formula volume equals an amount over a concentration. In this case the amount is the dose and when we figure that out we have 500 milligrams over 12 milligrams per liter and we get a volume of approximately 42 liters which happens to be the average volume of total body water. Now let's make this a little bit more complex. What if when we were putting the drug in there was something that was absorbing the drug like charcoal? And when we put the drug in, 90% of the dose gets absorbed into this charcoal. And when we analyze, we get a concentration of 1.2 milligrams per liter. So we use the same formula, same math, but this time we get a volume of 420 liters. Now this is where anybody that's ever smoked weed in the class makes a 420 comment and says, oh, it must be THC. But how can we have a volume of 420 liters when we know that the volume is only 42 liters? And that's because it's not 420 liters. It just appears to be 420 liters. And that's what volume of distribution is. It's the volume that your dose appears to distribute in. And in fact, a more appropriate term would be apparent volume of distribution. So how do we do this in humans? Because unlike the experiment we just did, when we give it in a human, the amount is changed. As we said before, as soon as we give the dose, it's being eliminated. So the amount in the body is changing over time. So we can give a dose, we can measure concentration over time, and then we can plot that on a log versus the log concentration versus time scale. Fit a line to it, and we can track that all the way back to time zero and we can find a theoretical concentration at time zero if this drug instantaneously distributed throughout the body. And then we can use that. We know the dose, we can have this theoretical concentration at time zero, and we can figure out the apparent volume of distribution. We can figure out what volume would explain that concentration. So when we give a drug that distributes very fast and we just have this this elimination, single slope elimination, it can be described by one, a one compartment model. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself. I don't want to really talk about modeling just yet, but you may run across something that has more than one volume, and you may say, well, what's the deal there? So some drugs, when we give it, take a while to completely distribute, 
and we actually have elimination before we have distribution complete. And many of our anesthetic drugs are like this. And when we plot the concentration versus time curve, we have more than one phase. We have more than one slope. And we can kind of peel this, this curve apart into a couple of straight lines. And then those straight lines that when added together will make that curve, each of those has a corresponding concentration at time zero. And we can use that to figure out a volume for each of those phases. And when we model, we have these two volumes that correspond to those two concentrations at time zero. Another term you might find is volume at steady state. And volume at steady state is just the sum of the volumes in a multi-compartment model. So that's what volume of distribution is. Let's say what volume of distribution is not. As much as we want to think about it in our heads as acting this way, there is no physiologic meaning to these volumes. They're all just the best mathematical fit to the data. So we often want to say that the slow compartment is our distribution to fat and this distribution is to muscle but there is no physiologic meaning to these volumes. We cannot take an obese person and then just increase the third compartment volume and have it mean anything. So that's it for part one of this video. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a great day.